Hey guys, Ruben here. And if you're watching this video, you're in my Shakespeare class. I've been looking forward to digging in to these plays with you guys and assigning parts and, and reading Hamlet and Midsummer Night's Dream and Othello and maybe even a fourth play. But now I'm kind of readjusting my plan a little bit since we're not meeting in class. And um, I'm trying to figure out exactly how to do this, guys. I've been thinking about it all week and taking notes down and... Um, I'm going to go about it the best way I can. The first couple weeks, I think we're going to actually not dig into a particular play yet. We're going to look at different parts of Shakespeare, a little bit about the history of Shakespeare, understand how, who he is, how he works, things like that. Look at some of his writing, some of the speeches he wrote, and then we'll actually start digging into the plays. And we're going to try to get through Hamlet, maybe through A Midsummer Night's Dream, but I don't know. I know it's going to be a little bit difficult for me to teach it without us meeting and we're going to do the best we can with it guys and I want you to know your teachers are going to be very sympathetic with you guys this quarter and my biggest advice for you guys is just try your best don't get stressed out I know we got a lot on our minds right now I I'm anxious a little bit anxious myself you guys know me or those of you that do know me know I'm a sensitive guy and can get myself worked up about things so if you're a little anxious or stuff right now it's only natural but um, I want you guys to know that Hope High is here for you and, you know, we'll do anything to help you guys out. Email any of your teachers anytime if anything's on your mind. And we'll get through this. A couple months from now, I think things are going to be a lot better. So this is Shakespeare class. And what I really want to address with you guys right now in this video is just why Shakespeare. What's the big deal about this guy? I mean, when you're a little kid, you hear the word Shakespeare, right? If somebody sees you writing a paper and they, on a piece of paper, they say, what's up, Shakespeare? Because Shakespeare is like the, the, uh, the synonymous uh, name for the writer, right? He's the consummate writer, the ultimate writer. Why? What's so great about William Shakespeare? Well, let me tell you guys something real quick here. If you uh, were to look at the average college-educated person what do you think their vocabulary is? How many words do you think that person would know? Get a number in your head. The average college-educated person. 3,000 to 4,000 words. Okay, The average college-educated person knows, roughly, somewhere in the ballpark of 3,000 to 4,000 words. Guess how many words are in Shakespeare's body of work? If you look at Shakespeare's 37 plays in the sonnets that he wrote, how many different words do you think we see? Over 21,000 words. That means that Shakespeare had a vocabulary of in excess of 21,000 words. The Bible has about 8,000 words in it, so that means that Shakespeare's almost, you know, three times uh, as big a vocabulary as God. That's sort of a joke. Um, but anyway, you get the point, right? So the guy has an extensive vocabulary. Well, big deal, right? Anybody can memorize words. Well, Shakespeare actually made up words, too. Some of the words that we see for the first time in print popped up in Shakespeare. So it's believed that, that Shakespeare um, invented some of these words. Uh, another thing about Shakespeare is he, we constantly, um, without even knowing it in the English language, we constantly use Shakespeare's language. If I tell you, um, oh, wow, that disappeared into thin air. I am actually using a frame, a phrase from Shakespeare's play, The Tempest. And it's such a common phrase now that it um, has become part of our language. And that's what Shakespeare's done. He, he owns the language. He influences the way we think, the way we talk. We're using Shakespearean phrases in our heads that we don't even know about because they've perpetrated into the English language over the last 400 years. So it's really quite astonishing. Probably the most miraculous thing about Shakespeare is that he wasn't setting out to do that. He was just a guy who was trying to make money with plays. Shakespeare lived from 1564 to 1616. And during that time, he moved from his hometown of Strat Stratford-on-Avon to London, where he took up uh, as part of a play uh, group. They put on plays at the Globe Theater. And it was during um, Queen Elizabeth's reign into King James the first reign, and he wrote during those two people. So he's a he wrote during the uh, Elizabethan English era, uh, the Renaissance, and he was just trying to make money. And Shakespeare was writing one play after the other, um, and he was pumping these things out, many plays in a year. And these plays were written, um, parts were just written down and passed around, so no one was actually collecting the work. So it wasn't like Shakespeare was trying to write 
literature that was going to be studied for the rest of history. This was in the early days of the printing press. So Shakespeare wasn't making mass copies of his plays. He was just writing plays. But his genius was so insane and so incomprehensible that he was writing plays that would become immortal and live on long after he did. And these plays are, are beautiful, organic, um, open to interpretation, powerful plays. He explores every single element of the human psyche, the human heart, the human condition from love to revenge to, to grief to to sorrow, to joy, to murder, to war, to kings and queens. I mean, his plays are filled with everything you could possibly want to learn about life. In fact, one of the great writers, um, one of the great American writers, Ralph Waldo Emerson, said that the world will be relevant because of the fact that Shakespeare lived here. He said if aliens observed our planet and saw who we were, they would change the name of the planet from Earth to Planet Shakespeare. Um, his historical influence is, is unmatched. Karl Marx um, loved Shakespeare. Thomas Jefferson loved Shakespeare. Abraham Lincoln quoted from Shakespeare all the time. Um, when John F. Kennedy was killed, his brother quoted Romeo and Juliet in the uh, eulogy that he wrote for his brother. Uh, Sigmund Freud, who's the most influential psychologist of all time, had read the entire body of work that Shakespeare wrote, all 37 plays, by the time he was... 12, I think. So his influence on the intellectual mind, on the human conscience, consciousness, is really unmatched. And I'll get a little more into the details, like what are iambic pentameter, what is an iambic pentameter, which is what he wrote in, um, what are soliloquies, things like that, as we move on. But I don't want to overwhelm you guys too much at first here. I just want you to kind of get a little feel for Shakespeare's language. And... Um, I think I'll go ahead and end with a little Shakespeare quote for you guys today. And before I do that, let me just tell you, um, we'll do a WebEx meeting this week, so I'll send an invite out to that. Uh, you watch this video. I'll have a couple other assignments to do this week. I'm not going to overwhelm you the first week with stuff on Shakespeare. I want to kind of get you thinking about language, first of all, and then we'll shift into thinking about Shakespeare. So just relax, guys. It's going to be a smooth quarter. We're going to make the most of it, and I am always here for you, as I always am at school, too. And uh, let me, before I give you guys a little Shakespeare, let me uh, have a bite here. My potatoes are keeping me fueled during this time. So I'm going to end this video with a Shakespeare uh, quote for you. This is going to be from The Merchant of Venice. When a Jewish character is telling someone else that it's his right to have revenge. Because even though he's a Jew and the society looks down upon him for being a Jew, he is still a man. And Shakespeare in this speech goes through what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to be alive? That is the central theme of Shakespeare's work. So I end with this quote. He hath disgraced me, and hindered me half a million, laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, cooled my friends, heeded mine enemies, and what's his reason? I am a Jew. Hath not a Jew eyes, Hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer, as a Christian is? If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? We are like you in the rest. We will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be? By Christian example. By revenge. The villainy you teach me I will execute, and it shall go hard. But I will better the instruction. And that's Shakespeare, ladies and gentlemen. You get to look forward to some of that next quarter. Have a great day. I'll catch you guys soon.